Hello friends, how are you? I'm doing okay, thanks for asking. I'm so pleased about to welcome you here to The Safe Place. A place where we are unapologetically open with difficult topics. You may even find yourself thinking in new ways and acting even more compassionately to others. Here you will hear the voices of those with powerful stories or interesting insights. You might hear tales that will make you cry, as much from sadness as joy and happiness. And that's okay. Each tale is told from a place of truth, and we hold dearly the principles of love, kindness and compassion to all. With that all said, it's time to hunker down, get comfortable, as you're welcomed into the safe place. Hello and welcome, Tom. Thank you very much for uh, for coming on today to the to the safe place oh, and, and welcome in. Oh well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. It's you know amazing to have you. So, uh, just for the listeners, so Tom Davies uh, from Proper Mental Podcast is is here with us today. Um, and as always, I'm going to pass straight over um, to Tom to to let him share a bit about himself. Oh, mate. Well. Um... That's probably everything you need to know, really. My name is Tom, and I'm the host of the Proper Mental Podcast. I'm also a a, a husband and a father, and they're probably my more uh, important roles. But yeah, my yeah. podcast, it's a mental health podcast, and I chat to someone different each week about a different aspect of mental health, mental illness, mental well-being. Um, and that's it in a, in a nutshell, really. Um, yeah, I, I, that's always a tricky question, isn't it, when you have to talk about yourself? I never quite know what to yeah, say. Yeah, and... And where where did it all where did it all start from? Because you, you've been doing it for what just over a year now. Yeah. It's March March last year. Wasn't That's it? it. Yeah. So I um, I had a lot of problems with my mental health from sort of 2016. Probably the big problem started, and yeah. um, along with my recovery journey, um, something that made a big impact on me was hearing someone else. I saw an Instagram video on one of the mental health days, weeks, months, whatever it was, yeah. and I saw someone kind of talking really open about it. And at that point, I'd never spoke openly about my mental health. I was very much, um, yeah, hiding it, hiding the fact that I wasn't very well. And uh, just to hear someone speak that openly, it was a, a quite well-known endurance athlete as well. So someone that was like, you know, known for being strong and, you know, had big muscles and, you know, all this sort of, like all this sort of stuff. Like kind of macho. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Like a man's man, you know, which is the opposite, yeah, yeah. opposite of me. Um, but to hear him speak so honestly, and I, I'd, I'd never, I wasn't aware of any type of mental health conversation or community at this point. I'd never heard anyone talk openly. And he was kind of, ex- you know, describing and some of the things that he went through and it was very similar to what I was going through and yeah. I kind of I got so much from it and at the time I wasn't I didn't really know I got so much from it but I banked it you know I remember thinking that yeah. was a nice thing that happened that felt important and it really helped me and I kind of banked it and then maybe fast forward a year or two down the line when I was in a much better place um I just kind of felt like I wanted to do something really. Um, I wasn't sure what, but I just wanted to talk. I just wanted to be involved. I just wanted to try something. And the sort of the podcast came from there, really. You know, the one thing I can do is, is talk. And uh, that <laughs> kind of kind of made sense, really. And I just kind of wanted to, yeah, maybe provide that for someone else, you know, have someone stumble across it. That was the original plan was to just waffle, yeah. waffle into YouTube and just put the videos up, me and my mate. Um, and then maybe someone found it at two in the morning when they needed to hear it, which is exactly kind of, you know, how I found, how I found that video. Um, so it kind of, it grew from there really. And it just it slowly turned into a, a podcast. I didn't really want to do a podcast initially. Um, yeah, okay. I kind of thought, well, you know, like a 40 year old white bloke talking about mental health, you know, there's kind of enough of them. I don't know if the world needs another, <laughs> you know, another person doing that. Um, but it kind of slowly just turned into that really. And, um, yeah, and it's just got, it's gone gone from there ever since and it it turned into much more than i could ever have imagined really but uh, yeah that's that's kind of where it came from and and do you think it's it is it now kind of a continuous growth you're looking for with it or is it you're just kind of enjoying doing and having the conversations with with what are really quite mixed and an interesting uh, groups of people yeah probably both of those things really um the impact it's had on myself has been huge um just kind of just to explore mental health and to learn to have a project something to work on 
yeah. you know, like a kind of a, like a lot of blokes around around my age um you know i'd kind of my life had become about my work and my family and i didn't really have a, a project i didn't really have a any creative outlet i had nothing to you know to to do in my spare time um so it's kind of filled that gap really um, which has been really good, you know, really good for my own, my own recovery. Um, so, you know, I, I, I say may, mostly I do it for me, but I'd probably be lying if I wasn't quite excited by the, by the growth of it, you know, and trying to mm. achieve something with it. Um, but yeah, what that is yet, I'm not sure what, what it could turn into. I think it's much more likely to provide an opportunity to do something else within the mental health space. Um, not necessarily with the podcast, you know, but maybe lead to an, yeah. an opportunity to, um, whether that's to get involved in, in speaking or, um, you know, I'm kind of in the process of trying to start my own charity and, you know, just something like that. So yeah, I'm not quite sure where it's going to lead me yet, but, um, it feels like it's leading me somewhere. And that, that must be quite exciting. So you've, you've, you've come from back in 2016 where you've, you, you've obviously not been in a good place to now being in almost it sounds like the opposite in that you're in a kind of a, a really sound place and you're almost excited by by doing what you're doing is that is that kind of fair to say yeah very much so yeah yeah no and no, i am in a i am in a good place yeah definitely i mean it's all relative right but um yeah. i'm in a good place and um i work very hard to stay in this place i have very okay. very uh very strong boundaries you know and i kind of um yeah, I make sure I look after myself. I make sure my, my life is built around keeping me well, um, which is a strange thing to say. You know, I have my own business and obviously I've got my family as well. And it's a strange thing to say, but my number one priority is is my mental health. And uh, for a long time, I prioritized all the other things in my life, thinking that that mm. was how I was going to be, you know, the best dad and the best husband and the best coach yeah. and all this stuff. And I prioritized everyone else and it didn't work out very well for me at all. <laughs> so now I uh, prioritize me and surprise, surprise, you know, like I'm a good dad, I'm a good husband, I'm good at my job. And um, so, yeah, so I am in a good place and, and it is quite exciting. Yeah, definitely. I, I, for a long time, I wasn't excited about anything. You know, for a long time, I was like pretty, uh, pretty, pretty miserable about everything. So, yeah, to have a kind of have things happening, you know, have things springing up and going on, and yes, yeah, it's 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 good. Yeah, it's really good, really positive. And 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 looking back then, so yeah, you know, you're now at a place where where it's kind of on a on a good on a good even keel, and you're and you're able to look after your own your own mental health. What's what's kind of changed then from 2016 through to 2020 to to now being able because I mean I, so I've been through my own experiences of mental illness um, uh, depression in particular um, and I've had it for a lot a long old time and that shift in mindset from going from not being great to being able to look after yourself is a difficult thing to do so h- how did you go about it what what was the change beyond just that first video that you saw? Yeah. I mean, it's been really, really slow, really, really slow. I've had two, um, I I call them breakdowns, but it's for want of a better term, really. I don't think breakdown kind of summons up these different connotations, really, of it being quite like dramatic and eventful. And it really wasn't that. It was much more of a slow collapse, really, um, that lasted a long time. You know, a breakdown, it tends to think like it's one big thing and then it's done, right? But um, these things tend to go on for a lot longer. So, yeah. It's like a slow puncture. Yeah, very much so, very much so. So that kind of happened in 2016. And um, I dragged that on, pretending I was okay till but 20, towards the end of 2017. Um, and my wife pulled me to one side and she said, look, you're not, you know, you're not you. Something's going on. I don't know what it is. You know, you need to get some help. And I sort of promised her I would. And I did, you know, but I also didn't. I did what I now call like surface level work. So I did loads of, you know, I did plenty of exercise and yoga and meditation and all this sort of stuff that's great for maintaining good mental health but it's not that effective at like pulling you out of the hole, you know? Yeah. And I, yeah, I carried on, carried on pretending. Um, and in December, 2017, things got kind of really bad and I started having panic attacks and things. And, um, the, one day quite close to Christmas, I left the house with the intention of taking my own life. And, um, that didn't happen for, I'm not, I'm still not quite sure how and why it didn't happen. Cause I was pretty damn set on it. Um, but that yeah. didn't happen. And that was enough of a wake up call for me to think, oh, now I need to get some, some proper help. Um, I went into therapy after that, I started therapy and that was a game changer for me to start to be aware of my behavior, 
my thoughts, my feelings. I was on autopilot, you know, like a lot of mm. people are I'd just kind of, I'd just be, I just did stuff. I just acted. I never thought about why I thought the way I thought, or I did things or the decisions I made. I never thought about why I just thought I did them because I was weird and because I was a bad person and I, cause I was horrible and I had to hide that from the rest of the world at all costs. Cause if anyone found out how weird I was, then I'd be ostracized and people would take my kids away from me and you know, all that sort yeah. of self stigma that goes on. Um, so therapy really, really helped me to kind of um, start to break down that that sort of stuff. And that kind of kept me ticking over, kept me ticking over for a little bit longer. Um, and we went into lockdown in 2020. And I was um, very, very fortunate that actually the those lockdowns, those initial ones um, at the time of my life, it was brilliant. It allowed me to kind of slow everything down and um, really kind of analyze the way I was living my life. And um, I realized I wasn't very happy with it. Um, just things about my work and just like the way I was carrying myself. And, um, so I started to think about all that stuff and then the world started again and I got parachuted back into, um, my old life, a life that I just spent sort of six months working out wasn't the life for me. And it was always more <laughs> like my brain wouldn't go back, you know? So, yeah. um, I, so many people were affected you know, through the pandemic with their mental health, but I had another breakdown when all that stuff stopped, <laughs> you know, when, uh, yeah, yeah. when everyone else was doing all right, that's when I got sick again. Um, and that was, that was probably worse than the, worse than the first one. Um, and ended up having to close my business and I came off work. Um, and I just really drilled down into, into doing the work. I did a lot of meditation, a lot of journaling, a lot of walking, a lot of like thinking. Um, I was in therapy a lot. I was going every week. Um, and uh, yeah, I, was, I just closed my business and, and just rode it out really. And then, uh, medication came on then and that made a big difference. Mm -hmm. That kind of allowed me to get to a point where all the other stuff started to really work then once, uh, once I started meds. Um, and then, yeah, that's kind of what got me through to, um, to where I am now. So it was a combination, really a combination of a lot of trial and error working out what works for me, what doesn't, um, and learning to be aware and read the signs. So I'm really good at spotting triggers now. Um, I kind yeah. of know what affects me. I know the little things that happen and I think, oh, that's my mind starting to turn. I need to do something about it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's what it was really just a, a combination of uh, making a lot of mistakes and, and doing a lot of the work, but <laughs> I suppose therapy and medication are the two, you know, the, the two classics, but they, they, they don't work for everyone, but they work for me. Yeah, it, it, do you know what? It's, it's a really interesting thing. The 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 medication in particular, because what I've found from just having different conversations with people, some people were really against it. Like you know, they're almost to the argument kind of um, extreme, really. And then you get people that I've had to try all sorts of different types and and gone through all sorts of different. Um, positives and negatives of them and i'd probably fit in that bracket but then found the one that or the ones in my case that seem to actually help and then you get the people that just have been i guess a little bit lucky in some ways but you know they just find the right one straight away and it's at the right time as well because that's one of the big things that that, that i've seen is that you could ha you could be put on medication so you could go to your gp put on medication because you're quite obviously experiencing depression, let's say. But if you just do that, actually it's probably not going to do a whole lot. It might, it might give you a bit of adjustment and there is, so I, I'm kind of looking into the kind of psychology um, piece and, and, and there is enough evidence out there to, to, to show that the medication will do something. So it, it, does, it does actually balance and, and correct that that um that kind of chemical imbalance to to think of it that way but if if you only do that you'll never fix the problem you'll never know how to then fix the problem later on and the the therapy ones um the thing that i've i've found by far the most useful but it's taken me three therapists to get there did you find that same thing with the therapy? Did you find that you had to go to different therapists to to be able to open up? Because that's that's what I struggled with in particular is actually opening up about it to start with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was quite lucky. I've always been with the same. I'm just about to like start with a new therapist actually next week, but um, I, I've cool. always been with the same with the same guy. 
Um, and I was quite lucky. I found him, found him straight. Mm. Um, and probably for the first six months that I was going, I was really holding back. Um, you know, I was kind of going in there on some really bad days and kind of like pretending it was okay. And I wasn't really working the process. I thought if I just went in and spoke to him, um, it would be all right. <laughs> yeah. I thought he'd just, I thought he'd be able to figure out that I was lying and do it for me, you know? And I, I actually, I, I naively believed that I'd have like this, almost like a goodwill hunting moment, you know, where he'd mm. tell me it was okay and give me a hug and we'd both cry and I'd be like, oh, I'm fixed. Um, so yeah, that was kind of my initial experience with it. And then, yeah, funnily enough, when I started like doing it properly, um, then yeah, then it started, started working. But um, yeah, it, yeah, initially it was more my problem rather than the therapy problem, really. Yeah, I didn't okay. understand what it was. I did, you, you don't know until you know, right? So I didn't, yeah. when I started getting sick, I had no idea what was happening. No idea at all. I thought I was going mad. I had no idea that you could phone your GP for mental health. No, like mm. that did not even come on my radar. I thought if I tell a, a medical professional some of the things that I'm thinking, I will be locked up. And that was my biggest fear. And it, it never occurred to me to go down that route. And I was one of those people, I really resisted meds because all I'd ever been told is horror stories by people who had had bad experiences. But there are loads of people who've had bad experiences, but there's also loads of people who've had good experiences. But because this conversation mm. around medication isn't particularly open, unless you go looking for it, you know, I'd only spoke to people who were like, ah, oh, you know, they, they turned me into a zombie and I put on loads of weight and, you know, like I, I, I couldn't sleep for months and I was like, well, I've got enough problems, man. I don't need to be an overweight zombie who can't sleep. <laughs> like I've got enough going on, you know? So I like, I've just resisted it so hard. Um, it was actually my auntie that talked me into trying them. She's a nurse and I'd had another, um, another time period where I decided that I was going to, um, end my life and I'd, um, I'd set a date and I'd put kind of everything in place for it to, to happen. So my family from Wales, I live near Liverpool and I was gonna, I uh, said goodbye to my wife and kids and I was driving down to stay at my mum's under the pretense of just having a weekend at home. Um, yeah. So, and then when I left Wales, I'd say goodbye to my mom and dad and my family. And I'd have this really like four hour window where I'd said goodbye to everyone in my life who meant something to me. And that was it. That was my, that was my plan. Um, and on the day I was leaving, I went for a walk and had a chat with my auntie and she's a nurse and, um, we've always been close and we've always kind of talked about like deeper stuff. And I think she just spotted that something was, wasn't right. And she started talking about medication and her own experiences with medication. I didn't know at that point that she'd been poorly and that she'd had meds. And she just kind of like, I wouldn't say she talked me into it, but she just planted a bit of a seed. Mm. And then I thought, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I need to be a, my kids need to know if I leave my children, my children need to know that daddy did everything, that it was the last resort. And I was like, well, I haven't done this. I've done everything else. I genuinely have done everything else but I haven't done this. So let's give this a try. And if these don't work in however many weeks or whatever, you know, well, let's put a pin in this daft plan. And if, uh, if these don't, don't work. Um, and to be honest with you, I, it could be, I've, I've still now, I suspect it might've been placebo because they kicked in quick. Man. Like the doctor said to me, um, you know, oh, they might take weeks to work. And I had all the side effects. I had nausea. I couldn't sleep. I was sweating. I was having mad dreams. All this sort of stuff was going on. But within like 48 hours, if that, I was back. Like my wife, me and my wife, we've been together for like 15 years. And she said it was like knowing me in my twenties again, you know, like it was, I had energy, like, like you wouldn't believe I was just, it's, yeah. and I don't, they can't have kicked in that quick. Part of me thinks that it must have been an element of placebo and that's fine. I don't care. It got the desired result. Um, yeah. Part of me thinks like I was just so desperate for someone to help me and then f for someone to like reach out and say, we'll try these, these might help. That was kind of like enough. That's all I wanted. Yeah. And that, that kind of helped me to some extent. Maybe it allowed, I've been working so hard on myself for years at this point. Maybe this was just like the missing piece of the puzzle and it allowed all the other stuff to kick in. I don't know. And like I say, I, I don't care, but for me, it, like they kicked in like straight away and just changed the game. So, um, it's one of those things like part of me thinks, yeah, I was dead lucky. I found the right therapist first go and I found the right meds first go. But then he's not that lucky because 
like the whole process took four years. <laughs> so, mm. Although um, if I'd have found them on week one, then that would have been lucky. But there was four years of uh, of chaos. Well, and, and I think the reality is that with these things, no one's lucky because you're experiencing mental illness. So, yeah. you know, it, it it's it we we use we use the language just because that's what what we're used to um you know in that oh you you're, you're lucky that you got the right therapist you you're lucky that you got the, the right meds but well none of that would have actually worked had you not been putting the work in your, yourself mm. yeah and that and that that's a really important thing with the meds in particular is that they'll they'll help you get to a point where you're able to do the work and that all of that just kind of has its own drive and 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 kind of um own momentum because the meds have kind of taken taken care of that other part of you. Um but on their own, if you just take them and and that's it, you'll you will likely you'll feel marginally better, but it probably won't fix your entire situation so you still had to do the work yeah i agree with that and you obviously did it yeah well you can't you know you can't heal in the same environment that made you sick right Mm. so sometimes you just gotta just gotta change it change it all up and i do live my life very very different to to how i used to you know like i said before it's kind of my priority and um yeah i I live i try and live my life i have like an 80 percent rule i try and live my life at 80 percent. that for me works and it just means I can plod along, I can get stuff done, I can be all the things I need to be and do all the things I need to do, but without getting carried away, without getting overwhelmed. And mm. then if something happens, like life is going to throw up things, you know, when something happens, I can absorb it because I'm only going at 80%. Whereas I used yeah. to live life at 100% all the time. I never stopped ever. I was just grafting, grinding on it all the time. And, um, yeah, when things happened in life, I couldn't absorb it. There was nothing left. There was nothing, there was no space in my life to accommodate anything. And I think that's where a lot of my problems came from, you know, um, it was a lot of the, I suppose for me, it was working out why I had to live life like that. You know, if you can't stop mm. running, what are you running from? And that was very much, yeah. um, so that was kind of the work element, but yeah. So now I, I plod along at a solid 80%, 80, 85%. And, um, that just gives me a bit of space to deal with whatever life throws at me. And for now it kind of, it seems to be working quite well. And, and you mentioned, um, you mentioned meditation, uh, as one of you, as one of your, your kind of things in the kit back, how did you come across meditation? Cause it, it if uh, a lot of uh, I've had some some good conversations around meditate, I, so I meditate. Um, I do. I'm a mindfulness practitioner um, and do quite a lot in in that kind of um, environment. And I literally stumbled across it. But I know people that are just completely ingrained in that world, and and I've kind of always done it. I'm sensing that probably wasn't you. You probably weren't the one that's that that's always kind of known about it. So, so where did that kind of start for you? Um, I, I like through my work. I work in the movement space, um, and so I'm a yoga teacher. So it kind of comes. Um, I'm not a particularly traditional yoga teacher, um, but it is. It's from that world, really. Um, from going to yoga. Uh, was the first time I'd ever experienced any sort of trying to be still or, uh, you know, <laughs> trying to take a step back from my thoughts or anything like that. Yeah. So I kind of, um, yeah, kind of from there, really, like a lot of people, I, I was recommended um, years ago, I used to work for the NHS. I used to work in a cancer hospital. And um, oh. one way they used to recommend for staff to kind of uh, not get too like emotionally involved in the work and stuff was uh, they recommended Headspace. And that was like the first time. Mm. I'd, um, I'd heard about that. So I kind of like did a bit on the app and, um, I didn't really take it too, too seriously. And then of course, when I was poorly, it was just like, it was a no go, you know, like I couldn't be still, like I'd hop up at the end of a yoga class and walk out, which is the, the height of bad manners in the yoga world to not stick around for <laughs> Savasana. But, um, I just couldn't be still with, with, with my thoughts at all. Um, it was petrifying to me, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah, it was kind of through the yoga world. And then, you know, a lot of my friends are in that in in that world a lot of my friends are probably quite would be considered quite spiritually out there um so it's yeah it's something i'm used to being around but it was yeah it was it's only in like recent years that i've kind of used it as a tool 
myself. It was yet another one of those things, you know, that I said I would used to meditate and I didn't really, you know, I just yeah. kind of done a bit of headspace now and again. And, you know, same way I used to kind of talk about my mental health and kind of talk and look <laughs> after my physical health. And, you know, it's just another pretense. <laughs> Um, yeah, but yeah, and I, I'm not like, I'm not hardcore. I don't meditate every day. I really want to be that guy who does meditate every day. Um, I've never quite be able to kind of build that habit, but a few times a week. Um, and it's a go when I feel life start to speed up, you know, I'm very aware in my body of when I start to go through the gears. Um, mm. then it's like, that's my go-to. I said, right, I'm making time for extra meditation this week. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make sure I kind of spend some, spend some time in that space. And, and I mean, obviously being a, a, a yoga instructor in itself will, will give you a kind of certain sense of, of space to be, to be able to do that type of thing. And, and you've probably got an environment in which to do it, but is there a particular place that you go to for your meditation? So, so I, I do a lot in the shower because actually the, the water for me is, is my way of, of actually being able to kind of focus on something and bring myself back into myself. Um, if I do it anywhere else, that's when I start to struggle a bit too much with it. Um, and have you got something similar to that or uh, a kind of method? Yeah, I, I like, um, I like to be guided. Um, I like the Tara Brack, um, Mm. meditations that she releases like next to her podcast i've never listened to a podcast i'm sure it's great but with each episode there's like a little 20 minute meditation that goes with it um so i like that i'm very lucky i live near the coast um so i like to go down to the beach um go out on the rocks and um yeah and just kind of sit and um you know feel the sun on my face or the, or the wind or the rain or whatever's going on um i tend to not meditate at home um, my house is a bit of a mad house. I've got two small children <laughs> and we practice a very, um, natural free type of parenting, which means there's always a lot of noise and a lot of chaos and um, yeah. I love it and I wouldn't change it, but there ain't no stillness in this house. You can't find it. <laughs> um, and you know, I like, again, when your kids are small, I used to try and like meditate at night and stuff. I just fall asleep, you know? So, um, yeah, I like to be out. Yeah. Um, and I could, there's something about, um, like walking down to the beach, um, that helps me kind of burn off a little energy to be able to sit still as well. Um, you know, sort of yeah, setting the intention of heading out there with that specific goal is something about the ritual of it, of like walking down and putting my headphones on and um, I'm finding my favorite rock. And there's something about the process that I quite like as well. Um, so yeah, that, that tends to, to work, work for me. And you mentioned the, the kind of putting the headphones on, um, so I experienced something that I hadn't actually, I hadn't acknowledged that experience before. And it was, I, I bought a new set of headphones, not, not, not the ones I'm wearing now, but like uh, Apple Air pod things. Um, and they're, they're great because they cut out all the noise um, outside. And I actually just sat and, and listened, properly listened to um, I, I'm quite into blues, so I, I was listening to um, uh, Hugh Laurie, and he was singing uh, Jer uh, Jericho, which is just one of those songs that I just I'm able to lose myself into. And I got somewhere similar to where I get to when I meditate through listening to music. Do you think that by doing that on your way to your meditation, that it kind of helps ground you back into? to um into your practice I, I mean sure it does i've never really thought about it to be quite honest with you but yeah i'm sure it i'm sure it does yeah i'm sure it I'm sure it does i found you know music very comforting and um I, a, a big thing for me i have a lot of problems accessing my emotions and understanding what i'm feeling and music for me has yeah. always been like a bit of a shortcut to that if i need to i'm aware i need to feel something but and mm. I can say that I feel it without feeling it. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. you know, so if I need to uh, if I need to kind of push a bit deeper into something, then it, that's a tool for me that I use yeah. to um, particularly when I start taking medication because like um, I, I, it's quite a common side effect of sertraline that you can't cry. Um, so yeah, if I kind of need to force some emotion out and access something, then then uh, music's I can shed a tear with the right tune, but um, yeah. <laughs> otherwise otherwise nothing's nothing's coming. But um, yeah, it's, maybe it's 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 a really important thing that actually the the whole being able to cry because it, it it's something I really struggle with. Um, I mean, I I could remember probably 
probably three times in the last probably five years where I've cried. One was at my mum's funeral. Um, one was the night that she died. And another was um, during one of my um, my kind of periods where I, to use your description, had a breakdown because it's similar to you. I've, I've been more of the kind of slow puncture um, and, and then getting to a point where I just can't do anything. Um, and I'm working a lot <laughs> on now trying to cry. Um, <laughs> one of the suggestions by my therapist is that I watch sad, sad movies. <laughs> but I've not found one yet. Have you got any go-to tunes then that, that you listen to that that will kind of bring about that emotion for you? Oh yeah, probably. Let me have a thing. It, like it depends on different. I try. I don't like to sad cry. I like to like happy cry. Okay. Um, because there's a difference, right? There's a difference. Yeah. And I, I am like, I'm quite fearful of what I consume and how it makes me feel. So I wouldn't watch a, a sad film. Like, you know, like I I just don't, I just don't, I don't have anything to do with it. Um, but yeah, something that really stirs it up, I suppose recently, is it, um, is it people's faces or humans faces by Kate Tempest that, Mm. oh mate, I'm not even sure I've made it all the way through that. That's heavy salads. And I don't even, you know, that really like kind of pushes, pushes buttons, man. That's a big, that's a big song. Yeah. But yeah, it's, 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 I, I, fi- I find the whole music thing um, just something that I love to delve into. I mean, I, I've always, music's always had a place for me where it's it just helps in, in whatever I'm dealing with. It just helps. So it could be that I'm really happy um, and I want to keep that happiness. <laughs> and there's certain songs that I listen to, like... Um, pretty much anything by jack johnson as an example because it was our it was our wedding song um better together so anything by jack johnson just brings back memories of going and seeing um a kind of concert where well, concert um uh what's call them a uh, festival um where he was playing and, and it was just like really chilled out really nice and and kind of mellow and that that keeps that that kind of happiness going and if i've got stuff where because the other thing I struggle with, and it'd be interesting to hear if you do as well, but is I struggle with anger and not in the feeling too much of it, but not being able to feel anger um, and not being able to kind of get that out of me. Um, so there's certain songs, generally Eminem, <laughs> that, that, that I'll go to. And I use it when I'm like doing, lifting weights and stuff. Like it, it's it's like the one that gives me that bit more aggression, I guess. Yeah. Um, it, do, do you find that with anger? Do you do you find that's a difficult emotion uh, to to kind of attach to? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I think that it must be in some way. Um, I generally not I don't have a great deal in my life to get angry about, you know. And I I, I do, you know, I genuinely don't care about that much stuff. Um, but like a, a how I know when my mental health is slipping is when like an anger comes out. Um, So yeah, if I start getting really short tempered and and, and quite aggressive over stuff that really like no one should care about, let alone me who doesn't care about much at all. um, That's like a sign for me. So there's obviously something there with anger, whether it's like leaking out, you know, when it shouldn't be, or, um, you know, I I don't drink. I'm just coming up on six years sober. And one of the reasons I got up, I I gave up was because I started turning into quite an angry drunk. It would leak out when I'd had a few beers and um, so a lot of misplaced anger. So I suppose I can feel it in the wrong places at the wrong times, Mm. you know, but, um, day to day, I've not really thought about it. I've not really, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. You give me something to think about there, mate. There you go. (laughs) It's it. I mean, and part of that is because it it's it's something that I mean, I I've got a few memories. So so, and and this is a, a fairly common thing actually with people that have been depressed for a long period of time so that you that you experience dissociation, and as a result of that, actually your memory of of your past is 
fairly limited. Um, <laughs> and mine's very limited. <laughs> but <laughs> there's the odd, the odd memory where I remember getting ang- angry and rather than actual anger, I would just break down and cry. Because I I just couldn't I couldn't do anything with that emotion, um, and it's something that that my my therapist and I are working on at the moment is to try and pull some of that anger out in a more kind of constructive way so that I can actually use it a bit more. Mm. Because I think anger is one of those emotions that we think, oh, that's that's bad anger. No, that's what gets people into trouble. But actually, we we need it. Much like fear, we need fear. There's a certain level of fear that we need to have to enable us to live our lives and to be safe and you know take our hand off the off the hob when it's um, when it's hot, yeah, and, and all, all these different things, or not not cross a street when there's loads of cars coming. Just simple things like that. Um, and anger is the same in that we need that that amount of anger to be able to release it so that we can then use it for um, constructive things like um, weightlifting is a, is a good example of it. When I lift heavy and I I don't at the moment because I'm just recovering from surgery. um, But when I lift heavy, I use the small amount of, of kind of aggression that I can muster to to lift because that's what helps me pull it up off the floor and, 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 literally lift some ridiculous weight up up off the floor which seems like such a simple thing to do um and it is it is one of those emotions that i think we almost avoid too much sometimes um and i'm definitely that person that, that avoids it too much um and just trying to figure out how to bring that that into a constructive thing for 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 me is is one of my one of my goals of the year is, is to be able to utilize anger in a, in a constructive way. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, mate, yeah. yeah. You know, if you think about like our natural design, you know, we're still very much like cave people living in a world mm. that doesn't exist, you know, and day to day we'd have to experience anger and fear and um, there would be a certain amount of almost violence and danger in the air yeah. on and off throughout just the normal day it would be just part of you know trying to get fed without getting eaten and yeah. like you know it's almost like we're too safe now you know so when these when these feelings arrive they're, they're misplaced and we don't know what to do with them and um like you say people are scared of anger but it's there there for a reason and you know you can't emotions are, are not clear cut and you can't suppress mm. one without suppressing a bit of another right you can't just say i'm not going to be angry and then still get to be everything else <laughs> that's, not, yeah. that's not how it works right so if you're going to suppress that anger something's going with it and then you kind of get left with like a mishmash of whatever's left over and it all gets dead confusing but um yeah well, and particularly with anger is the, the the opposite is probably excitement so if you if you're suppressing anger you're almost almost definitely going to be suppressing excitement, which then is going to then link into ha- your happiness and your and your drive and your wanting to do things, and it just kind of pulls you back, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, the the word that 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 I use probably too often, but is is that numbness? Um, in the and and you said it yourself a moment ago where. You kind of you, you don't feel your emotions. You don't. You, you kind of have to work at sensing them and, and understanding them. And and I I've kind of had that um, had that real real kind of numb feeling or absence of, of feeling. Um, and I think it's an interesting one at the moment because obviously it's mental health um, mental health awareness week um, and uh, loneliness being the topic. And it all kind of fits in. Um, with feeling lonely um and through your journey ha- have you had experiences where you've you've felt lonely i slightly leading, leading question i think mm. but yeah so I just talk yeah, about that very much so very very much so i'm so where i live now i live on the wirral and this is where my wife's from and i'm from wales originally and we met abroad we used to work for a holiday company so we met abroad and then we moved here so when i moved here i was like 30 31 and um yeah i didn't know a soul like not a single person you know, if I wanted to um, 
nip out in the morning to get milk for my brew. Well, I didn't know where the shop was. You know, it was just like being parachuted into this into this town. So I didn't know anyone. And making friends as a as an adult, you know, is is tricky. It's really really mm-hmm. tricky. You know, people tend to already have their friendship groups. Or you make friends through work, but I worked at that time in a, a office environment, so I was pretty much surrounded by like middle aged women um, who were all very nice, but I didn't really want to like knock around with them after work, and I'm sure the feeling was mutual, um, <laughs> you know. And I, I didn't have kids at that point, so you don't meet anyone through your kids, so I didn't know a I didn't know a soul, and I spent a lot of time on my own. I'm a very um, socially anxious person anyway, so when the opportunities did arise to meet people or join in, I'm not a joiner in a I'm not that person who's going to like turn up at the local five aside night and say like, Oh, can I join in? That's just not me. Right. That's just yeah. that's happening. Um, so I really like withdrew into myself because no one wants to admit they're lonely. No one wants to admit that they don't have any friends. That's not cool. Right. That's all that Billy no mate stuff from school. So I would say things like, I don't need other people. I'm one of life's solo artists. That's how I saw myself, you know, as that I'm this like stoic, I'm an island. I don't need other people. And I'd say things like, oh yeah, like I hate other people. Other people piss me off. I don't like other people. But what I really meant was I didn't like myself. You know, yeah. that's what I, I was lashing out on myself, but I couldn't come out and say that because I didn't even know I thought it. But um, yeah. And so I just isolated myself more and more and more. And um, yeah, and it, like very, very lonely. You're very, very long for a long time. And that was, um, that was a huge factor in, in, in me finally breaking. Yeah. Very, very much so. And even before that, even when I'd like worked abroad and I was in, you know, I had like really good social life over there, but I was just pretending to be someone else anyway. So it didn't really count. You yeah. Know? You're kind of like putting on a front, putting on a mask, trying to fit in, trying to hide the real you. If your self-esteem is low, um, you're lonely anyway. Cause you're not connecting with people. You're not connecting with people on a real level, on a deeper level. And I look back now and I've like, I've, you know, it was very few people that I was connecting with on that, that level. So I'd probably been lonely for a lot longer, you know, but it only came to light when I moved to somewhere that, cause I couldn't pretend anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's, um, yeah, yeah, man, it's hard. It's hard. I, I say loneliness is a modern day killer. It's a modern day killer. It's um, a horrible situation to be in very much. So yeah, I agree. I agree. And it, it, it's, I think it's really interesting that uh, talking about your, your kind of past of being around people all the time, but yet because you're not yourself, you're not having that emotional kind of emotional buoyancy or emotional um, warmth that, that you, that you usually get with really good um, happy relationships with people. And actually, I think there's so many people out there at the moment and, and the purpose of this week talking about loneliness is is very much that, that you can be surrounded by hundreds of people. You could be on you could be in a dell on stage in front of thousands of people, but yet feel completely alone and completely lonely. And that kind of experience is as you say, very difficult to talk about. But the second you do talk about it, it just opens up another world and and just opens up the relationships that you've needed. Yeah, yeah. Someone's got to go Uh, first, right? That gives everyone else permission to, to, you know, because we all hide these thoughts. No one wants to be the one to Mm. come out and say it because you think you're the weirdo. So if you say it, everyone's going to judge you. So everyone's doing the same thing. Everyone's pretending it's all right. You know, and society's built for us to connect on like this surface level. So it's like when someone takes their own life and everyone goes, oh, I, like I never saw it coming. I never saw it coming. And it's just because all you ever talked about was football and beer and banter. You know, that that that's a big part of it. We don't know each other. I had hundreds of friends, hundreds of friends. And all I ever did was like, you know, take the piss out of each other, go for pints, talk about mm-hmm. the football, you know, talk about the UFC, like just all of all these like shared interests and stuff. But it, like I don't know anything else about them, you know. I didn't know, you know. Maybe some people you don't even know their surname or their real name. If they got, yeah. if you get introduced to someone with a nickname, you can be like mates with someone for years and then find yeah. out they're called something, and you go, "What? Your name's Steve? I didn't know that." You know, like it is so surface level. And again, we're not we're not designed physiologically to have massive, massive social circles. We're designed to have yeah. smaller groups that we 
like live with and live and breathe with and know intimately and know well and support and look after. And we've just, it's one, another one of those things in modern life. It's just a wrong way round, Right. And it just leaves yeah. us, like you say, you can be, um, yeah, you can be with a lot of people and still be really lonely. Definitely. Well, and, and you see it. I think, I mean, I, I've, uh, I've just finished, uh, probably a week or so ago reading Will Smith's book. Um, and yeah, he's someone that is, certainly was adored by millions and millions of people around the world. And if you, if you read his book, you'll realize that actually he was very alone to the point that he didn't know who he was up until, yeah, he was 50. And I've given recent events. I would suspect that he's still, still trying to figure that out. Um, and it just goes to show that it doesn't matter how many connections you've got. It doesn't matter how many people that you know or the crowds that are adoring you. If you're not actually feeling the warmth that you need in that situation from them, and that and that need is different for different people. So it might well be that actually for for someone because they're really, really extroverted and that, and they're, they're kind of their way of recharging, uh, is, is to be in big groups, of people. And that's, that's, that's their method. Um, and that's great, but it, it also might be that you're really introverted. Um, and I'm, I'm more on that scale. Um, and actually what you need is, is a small select group of people to kind of help recharge you and just help give you that energy, um, that you need to thrive and, and live quite frankly um yeah it, it's it, it's really um really opened my eyes that to to kind of how how it doesn't matter how many people that you know um if will smith feels lonely <laughs> probably the most well-known man on the planet um then anybody can feel lonely yeah i mean you know if you're chasing that that life you know if you're chasing that fame and adulation and you know i don't know i'm sort of generalizing here but i'd imagine you a lot of people are chasing that for reasons right they need that some sort of like validation they need yeah. you know and then it must get addictive i suppose i don't know i can't think of anything worse than being same than being having any sort of like um you know platform or fame or notoriety oh mate it would just be i cannot think of anything worse i'd much rather just be like at home and skin <laughs> just yeah it, it, that's, it suits me much better uh, just better to chill out and have some nice conversation yeah that's it man that's it that, that'll do me that'll do me for the rest of my life yeah very much yeah so, it yeah. sounds good sounds yeah. good <laughs> um one thing that i always ask my guests is um and there's I will warn you, there are three questions. Um, uh, we'll go with this one first. But one, one that I always ask is looking back when you were when you were young, so when you were kind of five years old, so in your formative years, what what bit of advice would you give to your your five year old self uh, if you could now? Um, it's probably like a really cliched answer. And I reckon you get a lot of people saying the same thing, but it was don't care what other people think, you know? And at five, I probably wasn't caring, but it wasn't long after yeah. that I probably started. And look at my kids now. My son's just turned six. I've got daughter who's four. And, um, you know, they're still at that stage now where, where they just don't care. They're just so free, you know, and it's inspiring. It helps me mm. to stay free. But I know that day is coming when they start to, not be so free you know and that's as a parent that's one of my scariest things but yeah it would be like that so many problems in my life came from um not wanting to be seen you know not feeling like i was um worthy not feeling that i had worth uh those sorts of things yeah and i'd go back and say don't 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 care you know because the more i'm still learning to access myself i'm still not very good at it um but the more i do you know, all the things about me that I thought would push people away are the things that brought, bring people in. And uh, mm. yeah, that would be my advice to to any five-year-old would be to, uh, yeah, never start caring. Maybe that's a better way to say it because at five, you don't care, right? Don't start caring what people think of you. Just stay free. Yeah. Stay free. And, I mean, I, and yeah, it's something that people say for a reason. 
because actually as a, as we grow older like you say you you just become bothered about stuff that to be honest it's not worth your time <laughs> not worth your time 100%. not worth your energy yeah 100% and if anything it it, it just holds you back definitely held me back yeah yeah definitely i think i think most people are at it to be fair that's the sad mm-hmm. thing you know that's the sad thing is that everyone's going around caring what you know and i was thinking like well i never really cared about anyone else because i was too busy being ashamed of myself you know so if we're mm-hmm. all doing that <laughs> then no one really cares <laughs> yeah. you know about anyone else so we're all just doing it to ourselves which is really sad you know well, and, and, and there's that that side of it in that as soon as you start caring about other people's opinions, then you basically don't have your own anymore, which means that you're then not able to focus on yourself, which means that by not focusing on yourself, you then get into a bad position, which means that you can't then help other people. And most people are driven to try and make things better for people. But you can't do that if you're bothered about what everybody else is thinking you see you need to be able to kind of center yourself back onto what is it that i need what is it that i want how am i going to do that and yeah you you build people up in in your own way by doing that yeah it's a lovely way of looking at it man yeah it's really nice really nice so yeah that just came to me <laughs> <laughs> um the other one that I, I always ask, and then the third one is not my question. Um, so I, I get previous guests to, uh, to ask a question for, um, for, our, for the next guest. So you'll have the, pr- the privilege of doing that as well. Um, but the other one is, it, it's one that you might've been asked before. I'm going to be your cook. So first part of the question is, it's a dinner party. Um, you can have, anything you want and just pretend for the moment that I'm the best cook there ever has been <laughs> and really pretend. <laughs> um, so what, what would you have? What, what, what would be your meal? Wow. Um, I, I, it certainly wouldn't be too anything too fancy, you know, it wouldn't be, um, yeah, I don't know what I'd have. I don't, you know, I don't, I go out very rarely, you know, like yeah. I say, parents, I go out very rarely and it's always pizza, man. Pizza or a burger. Yeah. yeah okay. A good burger, mate. You can't, can't go wrong. Knock me up a really decent burger. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. That's yours. <laughs> um, and then the other side of that is who would you have at the table? So you've got, so I'm there with you and we're, and we're in a good conversation. There's four other seats. Who would you have there? Wow. Um, Alive or dead? Does it matter? Alive or dead? Alive or dead? No. Wow, that's a that's a really interesting question. I, it, there's always that tem- temptation to kind of like be really pretentious, you know, and pick, <laughs> you know, pick people who are kind of like known to be wise or yeah. you know to get some sort of insight. But I don't think I'd go down that route. You know, I think I'd go for my, I think I'd go for my heroes. You know. Yeah. Um, so maybe as a collective Pearl Jam, maybe, you know, could pretty much fit most of the, most of the band in, in those, uh, yeah. those other seats. So something like that, or a series of, um, people that I would love to meet in person. And again, they'd all be like musical heroes. So, you know, yeah, people yeah. that I grew up with people like Liam Gallagher or yeah. Richard Ashcroft. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam, Neil Young, Neil Young, Bob Dylan. That would be a cool table, man. Of like all the OGs, Neil Young, yeah, Bob Dylan, um, Van Morrison. I'm trying to think who's, yeah. who's still alive. Um, yeah, that sort of maybe that maybe go like go that way. You know, a table of all the old G, sixties yeah. and seventies, um, yeah, rockers, something like that, man. It would all be music, at, um, music related, and I'd have no interest in in um, you know Gandhi or. <laughs> any anyone clever like that give me the give me the stories from uh neil young in laurel canyon in 73 straight from the horse's mouth give me that instead you know see see mine was always that the one that i always go to um and it is it does sound really pretentious it's plato but it's not it's not plato at any other time apart from when he was learning so I don't want his, him when he's kind of come to all of his ideas and, and kind of got there. I want him in his like formative years because I want to see who he was yeah, and, yeah. And, and how his mind worked. 
to how he then got to where he got to. Cause I, cause I think I find that more interesting than like, like Will Smith, as we talked about him, like, I wouldn't want Will Smith now. I'd want Will Smith like when he was like 10, because that Will Smith is, is kind of the core of who he was yeah, yeah, and who he now is. And that to me is just more interesting than, uh, than the stories that I'm sure he could kind of flood the, uh, the room with and kind of take over the room because he's a big old character anyway. Yeah. But, yeah. But yeah no, I think people, I, and I, you know, I find the more I kind of talk about me, the more I find that there's always elements of that's like really performative. You know, so there's like bits that you just, just bits of my story that just roll off my tongue because they rolled off a hundred times before. And I think yeah. that would be the thing, man. You had a room full of um, Plato's and all the rest of it. You know, like you say, you're getting the finished article, you're getting that polished, yeah. polished response, almost like the media version of Plato. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I dig that, man. Yeah. Yeah. Catch him when he, uh, yeah. Catch him on the way up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so we're now we're now at the point where um it's a question from a previous guest and so this guest was a guy called nick anderson um so he's a he's a fitness guy um really good guy actually american which which um it's just interesting in its own right because he was saying tomato i was saying tomato <laughs> um <laughs> But his question is, what is the strangest thing that you've ever tried? The strangest thing that I've ever tried. Um, crikey. There's probably a few. When I think back to my, um, my repping, my repping days, probably quite a few things to be quite honest with you. I once in Italy, I drank, I drank, um, stinging nettle grappa. Would you know that Italian after dinner? drink yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and it had a stinging nettle in it and that wasn't a th- th- that's how it was made someone it wasn't just like put in there that was a it was an actual <laughs> thing um that was pretty intense and um <laughs> i tell you i worked in france with a mate of mine and he's still a good pal of mine um his name's matthew reese if he listens to this we call him hank and he was obsessed with um hot dog sausages and so for his birthday his 21st birthday in the south of france we all did um uh, like vodka and hot dog sausage, <laughs> like a tequila. <laughs> so it was bright, bro- vodka and brine in a shot glass. And you had to <laughs> lick, lick the sausage, drink the shot and then eat the sausage. And um, yeah, <laughs> that was bizarre. So <laughs> that, I think that might be the weirdest thing I've ever, I've ever tried off the top of my, off the top of the dome. The, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's I, the one. That's uh that's probably the best answer we've got to a question. <laughs> <laughs> no one would have predicted it. That's for sure. No one would have been. Oh, it's amazing the things that you get out to when you're younger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Very much so. But yeah. Awesome. Uh, look, thank you so much, Tom. That's, that's been a, a really good, um, wholesome conversation. So thank you very much for coming on today. Um, and for anyone that's listening, where can they find you and your podcast? Oh, mate. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed that immensely. Yeah, that was so much fun. Um, at Proper Mental Podcast on um, social media. Instagram's the best bet. I'm not great at social media. I don't really. It's not a space I enjoy. Um, Instagram is kind of my favorite. Um, I can't really cope with the others. That's part of my, yeah. part of my 80% rule. There's only room for one platform. Yeah. So yeah, at Proper Mental Podcast on um on Instagram or propermentalpodcast.com for the website. Wicked. Thank you. That's awesome. And uh, for everyone listening, uh, as always, we'll finish this off with um, kindness, with love and with compassion. Cheers, Tom. Thank you, mate.